It's so, it is so good to be here. I say that quite a lot, but actually I'm away from the wife and the kids, so it's even better this morning. Hello everyone at home. I will try and remember you're there, but it's a bit hard to speak to an iPhone. Do you know? Like, well, it's not because that's its job, but you know what I mean. Um, anyway, today, in fact, I should probably just tell you a little bit more about myself, if that's okay. Um, but I'm, I'm an ex-drug addict bouncer who found Jesus on an alpha course, actually. Um, and that's probably a bit more of a believable life story than me being a Christian. You know, the tattoo and the beard and the trainers and the shorts, like, you know, this is me actually making an effort to get dressed today. And many people will struggle with that. And I, and I appreciate that I am not everybody's standard go-to. Like, you know, Glenn's got a cardigan. He looks like a, what a minister should be, right? Do you know what I mean? Like, he's got that. What, you, what have you lost? Here we go. Can't take him anywhere. Um, but actually, one of the things that I am, um, I always get the opportunity to do, and I've had the opportunity to do thousands and thousands of times, is tell my story. And, you know, when, when you're in church, you, you guys will have all heard these kind of power testimonies, as I like to call them. You know, these stories of people's lives that were like going down one route, and it was all disaster, and then God steps in, and it all changes. And like, I've got one of those stories, right? And everyone's like, oh, I wish I had a story like yours. But actually, do you know what? I, I don't. Like, do you know, I want the story of somebody that's been a Christian for 85 years. Do you know, that's been, that's only known Christ her whole life. Like, that's the story I hunger for. That's the story that I'm like, oh, I wish I had that story. Do you know, and it's always quite interesting because we always think the grass is greener on the other side, don't we? Do you know, and I can assure you, being a Glasgow bouncer and getting stabbed as a hobby is not what you want in your testimony. Do you know, like, you want the, you want the long-term relationship with Jesus. And I'm, I'm getting on a wee bit now. You know, I'm 38, I think. Um, so, yeah, I'm really old. And um, I realize there's other people who are slightly older than me. But we don't talk about age, do we? We're all one family. So, um, but, the, but the reality is, what would it have been like? I've only been a Christian for 13 years. And I'm just like, what would it have been like if I'd been a Christian for 26 years? Or 38 years, like how much more would I know God? How much deeper would my relationship be? How much more could I have achieved if I had just had that time? And ultimately, I think what we need to get back to is what the Bible's all about, and that's telling stories. Because that is what the Bible is, isn't it? You know, when we read the Bible, what is the stuff that sticks out to us? It's the stories. It's the feeding the 5,000. It's the the talking donkey, the burning bush, do you know, it's the Noah and his big boat, um, you know, or ark, I believe is the correct term. Um, I have been to Bible college, believe it or not, so I do know things like that, do you know, but, but the reality is, like, I, I don't get hung up on all the detail, but I love the stories, and being Scottish, we love a good story, don't we? We love a good yarn, we love being able to sit around the fire and like just chat and share about what's been happening and what's going on in our lives and what's going on with everybody else and you know hearing about hearing about what wee genie's been up to have you heard what wee genie's been up to Ooh, we all love a story right you know and if you think about comedians comedians tell the most amazing stories kevin bridges is a prime example his language is a bit choice for some but he tells great stories peter k tells great stories these guys that make a living being funny it's because they tell great stories and actually do you know something we've got the best stories the bible's full of amazing amazing stories but i think sometimes we forget to tell them or the assumption that we sometimes make is that everybody knows that oh, that's not going to go well that would have been a youtube disaster um but what would it look like for us just to know our stories better and be able to tell our stories, maybe in a different way, because the reality is I work a lot with Generation Z and what I'm coining Generation A, which is the generation after. I'm writing a book on it, I think, um, so stay tuned. I'm probably not. Um, but the reality is that these guys don't know our stories. When we talk about Moses or we talk about, you know, oh, you know that bit with Mary and Martha? No. No, they don't. A large percentage, so 46% of the population now are under 30. And most of them will never have been in church. Most of them will never have encountered the glorious joy of hearing these stories firsthand. And I actually think, what would it look like if we could just own our heritage a little bit? 
What would it look like if we could get back to knowing our stories so intimately that we can share them? Because we all know, right, when we're having a tough time, when we're struggling, where do we turn? The Bible or God. But the reason we turn to God is because we know the story. We know the history, you know. Like, Glenn's great, but you don't go to him with everything, do you? Do you know, like, in those life and death moments, you're going to pray for Jesus to turn up, not Glenn, you know. Like, yeah, definitely not Glenn. Um, <coughs> but the reality is, in those times, what is it that we come back to? Why is it that we make that choice? It's because we know the story, and we know the story in our life. We know the, the influence that God has put into us to change us to be the people that we are today. Now, I stand in front of you as a broken, destroyed wreck of a man, right? I am a mess. Like, I shouted at my kids this morning, I definitely ran through a speed camera on the way here. Sorry, darling. Um, I'm hopefully it didn't have any camera in it. Do you know? I had my music way too loud. I wasn't. I genuinely wasn't listening to worship on the way over. I was listening to Daft Punk, and I had it cranked because it's a summer's day, and I was enjoying myself, and it's good to come over, right? But God still can use me in that messed up place, like. But it all comes down to knowing who I am and knowing who God is in me and knowing the Bible. And actually, I'd love to look at a story today that is just one of my favorite, favorite stories. Would that be okay if we just looked at one of these stories? It's amazing, right? Zoe, could you stick the slide on for me? Do, 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 do. Nice. Oh, could you have the next one, please, pal? Oh, look at that. That was a smooth transition, wasn't it? Magic move on a Mac. Beautiful thing. Um, it says this in Matthew 27, 32. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry a cross. Oh, it's exciting, isn't it? We all know this story, don't we? The people out there don't. So I'm just going to give you a quick run cap. There's this guy, Jesus. He's been around for a while. He's been messing things up. Um, and uh, but for the good, right, he's here and he's trying to make change for, for God's glory. He's trying to tell people that there's an opportunity to have a different life, a life full of abundance and joy that all you need to do is accept him. But the powers that be didn't really like that, so they decided to kill him because that's what powers that be tend to do. So they've whipped him, they've beaten him, and he's walking down the street carrying this big hunk of a cross, and he falls down because it's so heavy, he can't carry it anymore. He's, he's been whipped, he's got thorns in his eyes, he's covered in blood, he's sweating, it's roasting. It's like as hot as it is outside, but like add 30 degrees, like so 400 degrees centigrade, like Scottish people would die instantly in this heat. Do you know, it's like roasting, and he's just broken, and he's down on his knees. And then this Roman soldier sees this guy called Simon from Cyrene, and they forced him to carry the cross. What a story, right? And then if we jump to a different passage, but the same story, could we have it on, please, Zoe? Beautiful, thank you. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. So this is another account of the same story. This is this guy, Simon, he's walking along. This time we know a little bit more. He was coming in from the countryside. Now, he was coming to be part of the Passover celebration. Like he was coming to enjoy Easter with everybody. He was ceremonially clean. He had, like, got all his papers in order. He'd been saving up his pocket money so that he could come to Jerusalem and have a good time. Like, we summer holiday in Jerusalem celebrating with your pals. Kind of think going to frenzy or soul survivor or one of those big christian -y things that used to happen do you remember when we were allowed to meet together in groups <coughs> so they're all going along on this journey and it's just this like he's like oh come on guys it's going to be great -hoo -hoo. and then it's like you pal come here carry this cross and he's just like what is happening here now if we go to the third um slide from his way <coughs> It says, a passerby named Simon, who is from Cyrene, was coming in from the countryside just then. We already knew this. This is it just repeating through the Gospels, but we know this much, right? 
And then the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Again, no spoiler there. But how about this bit in brackets? Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Ooh, Simon was a dad. We now know a little bit more about Simon. But that's it as far as the Bible goes. That's all we know about Simon, right? Isn't that a brilliant story? I think it's really good. This guy carried a cross, right? We might want a little bit more information than that to really get the joy out of it, right? See, this guy, Simon, was just a passerby. And in the moment, he got plucked out of the crowd to carry this cross. And he got alongside this guy called Jesus, who was soaking wet and covered in blood. And he was walking with this man, not really knowing why. He's probably thinking, why have I done it? Like, I'm now not ceremonially unclean. I can't be part of Passover. I'm covered in blood. I've got to carry this bit of wood. This is a rubbish day, right? That's like turning up in Portobello and then Glenn making me carry everything up the stairs. Like, it's just like, no, I am no doing that, mate. I am, I am your guest. Like, do you know, like, what is that about? Of course I would, you know, because we're servants. But this guy's stuck here. And then he's getting spat on. He's getting insults hurled at him. And he's like, what have I done to deserve this? Like, I've got no, like, I didn't choose to do this. Like, I'm stuck here in this moment. And then we know, th we know the end of the story, right? We know that the cross goes up with Jesus to Golgotha and Jesus is crucified. And it's this, this moment where Jesus is on the cross. But I don't think Simon could have stopped watching. He's in, that, he's in that far, isn't he? Like, it's not as if he's going to have got there and went, right, I better go have a shower and get back to it. Like, he's captivated in this moment. And in that moment, he's stuck there watching this guy and then sees his, his life drain away. And he must have just been like, because I think in that moment, Simon knew who Jesus was. He was shoulder to shoulder with him at his most difficult time. None of the disciples were. Nobody else was, but Simon was. He was there beside him. And you know, what's, what's really interesting is if we jump forward a little bit, we actually find out that Simon's two sons in Romans, they're mentioned. It says that Rufus, mentioned by Paul in Romans 16, 13, was the son of Simon the Cyrene. Isn't that interesting? So one of his sons has became a missionary. Now something must have happened there, right? So what can we work out from the story? We must have worked out that Simon became a Christian. Simon was one of these guys who actually get, who was like, I'm in. We can work out that Simon was bought into this thing from this one moment. Now that's a powerful story in itself, right? But we also know that um, Simon was the first bishop, the Archdiocese of Avignon, and he was crucified. He was martyred in the year 100. He went on to live a life pointing towards God, pointing towards Jesus from this one encounter. <clears throat> now, I don't know, maybe he was at the day of Pentecost, maybe he wasn't. Maybe he met Paul and these other guys, maybe he spent time with the disciples, maybe he didn't, I don't know. We don't know, it doesn't tell us. But what we can tell is that his life was miraculously changed and he went after it for the rest of his life. He told his friends, he told his family, he told his sons, he led his sons into the kingdom and they went on to be game changers. There's even an argument that they were the guys who actually preached, <coughs> that they were the guys that actually preached to the Greeks for the first time. And that exciting. Now that's a story I, I want to be a part of because I'm like, come on. I know hardly anything about this guy, but I know that he spent three hours with Jesus, watched him die, and his life was turned around to the point where he died for what he believed in. Now that's the type of thing I want to be a part of. I'm like, come on, that's power, right? And actually, when it comes to sharing our story, I think that we can learn a lot from Simon. Can we have the, last, the next one up, please, pal? And I think it breaks down to three things because all good Baptist sermons should have three points, right? And these are my three points. Simon, top left, didn't stand back with his arms folded. He got involved. He didn't have any choice at the start. He had to carry that cross. The Romans had power. He had to do what he was told. But 
everything after that was his choice. And he chose to be a part of it. He chose to say, do you know what? I have a responsibility here. My life has been changed so dramatically that I need to be a part of telling other people. And I don't think he had all the answers. I don't think he was like some super evangelist like Paul or Peter. Like He just went about and shared his faith with the people around him to the point where he got recognized and became a bishop. It's pretty cool, right? Just a run-of-the-mill Christian guy. Granted, he had met Jesus and carried the cross. But apart from that, run-of-the-mill Christian guy, right? But he got involved. And in the bottom left-hand corner, <coughs> they chose to be bold. They chose to take a step across the line of actually saying, do you know what? I'm not just going to sit in the background. I'm going to take that step to share my story with other people. Because you can guarantee that Simon told people that story, right? Do you, do you think he was just sitting by the, like, I was going to say pub, but maybe not pub. He was sitting outside in a nice well one day, and somebody comes back and like, you ever heard about this guy, Jesus? And he's like, let me tell you a story, boy. I was the guy that carried the cross with him. Like, he told that story, and it had power. What's our stories today? What are the stories in our lives that we need to tell? What's the stuff that's happened in your day-to-day that changes things? Because testimony doesn't just stop. Like, 13 years ago, I got saved. But that doesn't, that's not the end of my story. That's the bit that everybody focuses on. Oh, yeah, Des, God take away Dres's drug addiction overnight. Isn't that amazing? I was all right. But see, the 13 years since have been even better. Like, I, I got a degree. I went to Bible college. Like, I got a family. I've got a wife. I've got two kids, a third on the way. I live in one of the best areas that's full of drugs in Scotland. Like, we get to love on people. We get to, I've seen literally hundreds of people come to faith. That's my story. That's the stuff that I live for, that I dream about, that I, it keeps me awake at night not being able to share my story with people. Like, being in lockdown has been really hard because I can't just go and chap on people's doors and be like, hey, do you know about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Not that I'd do that because that would be weird, right? But that's kind of how I feel right now. Like, I want to do that. And it's, and it's because of this last slide, this last wee picture here, that really makes me get to the, the root of what it is. We need to have fun. The gospel's about joy and releasing hope to the hopeless, releasing love to the lost, loving the least, the last, and the lost. And actually, does that picture not just sum it up for us? Is that not what it's like being a Christian? Big eyes, bubble gum, happy. No? No? It is for me. Like, see if we're missing this. Like, we have hope and eternal life. We are being released into this thing. Like, granted, life sucks right now, doesn't it? Like, it's a bit rubbish. But at the end of the day, we know where we're going. And I'm going to heaven, and it's going to be a party. It's going to be epic. I'm going to be hanging out with my mates for eternity, worshiping Jesus who changed my life, spending time with Simon and saying, what was it like carrying the cross? Did you get splinters, mate? Like, how did you tell people about it? Like, what was the story? That's the passion that I want to be involved in. That's the stuff that I think we are called to be a part of. We're not called to moan about curtains. We're not called to get overly worried about what's going on. I really hope the curtains aren't coming up in your church meeting after because that would be really bad. They're not. Okay. Cool. We don't need to worry about that stuff because we know where we're going. But we need to get back to that. And that ultimately comes back to knowing our Bibles and knowing what the Bible says and sharing our stories, seeing what goes on there and, and just being able to genuinely share with people. And there's another thing that's really good about this picture. She can't speak when she's blowing a bubble gum. And we need to be great at listening. Because actually, do you know, I'd love to tell you a story about my neighbor, a guy called Luke. And um, when I moved into the area, Luke was like, what is it you do? And I was like, oh, I work for the church. And he just laughed in my face, right? Which is a common occurrence. And um, he's like, no, but what do you really do? I was like, no, no, I, I genuinely do. He was like, all right, okay. And he went away, and then he, he came back a couple of days later, and he's like, I've been on your Facebook. You really are a Christian, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I am. He's like, oh, it's weird. He's like, I can't believe in that. And I was like, oh, fascinated. He was like, I'm a scientist. And actually what Luke does is he designs 
the bit, or he works on the bit that makes sure nuclear weapons hit their target, right? Really cool science, you know, horrible job, but really cool science, right? And I'm chatting to him and he's like, yeah, you know, as a scientist, I can't believe that. I was like, yeah, I was like, there's been a few Christian scientists over the time. In fact, Christianity pretty much invented science. And he went, that's nonsense. And I was like, no, let me show you this video. So I showed him the video of this guy called Francis Collins, right? And Francis Collins led the team that mapped the human genome. Two billion lines of code, right? I show him this, and it's an interview in the first episode of Alpha. And I show him this, and he's just like, oh, my word. He said, I love Francis Collins. He was like, is he a Christian? I was like, yeah, he's one of my crew. Yeah, yeah. And he was like, no way. He was like, and this video is really good. He was like, is there more of it? I was like, yeah, it's kind of like a box set. And he's like, all oh, right. He's like, do you want to watch it together? I was like, yeah, I suppose we could. And at that point, I had to come clean and say, I actually work for Alpha. Um, so, you know, like, we could watch it together. And he was like, right, sure. So he used to come around to mine on a Monday night. And uh, I bought in beers, deeply spiritual moment. And he came around and we would watch an episode of Alpha together. And we would just chat about the biggest questions in life. Now, at no point did I overly pour the gospel on him. It wasn't as if I was trying to answer his questions. I just sat and listened to the questions he had. And then we had a chat about it. There was no pressure. There was no hard sell. Because, you know, the thing is, like, I'm not an evangelist. Like, that's Billy Graham's job. Like, I am, I am not Billy Graham, do you know? Like, I don't tie my shoelaces up. Like, I'm not a grown-up, do you know? My job is to create a space for other people to encounter the Holy Spirit, and then I let the Holy Spirit do its job of convicting and showing people who He is. That's all I need to do. I need to be a big signpost, and granted, I am a bigger signpost than most of you, but it's not hard to be a signpost, right? It's not hard to point and say, this is what God's done in my life, Luke. He does. And over the next few weeks, in fact, week one, Luke said, I'm, I'm okay with this, but I'm not going to become a Christian. I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. Week two, he's like, have you got a spare Bible that I could uh, have a wee look at? I was like, sure, man, yeah, yeah, there you go. And week three, he's like, cool, so I've became a Christian, and uh, I was wondering, could I bring a few more people? And I was like, eh, sure, uh, yeah. So, like, other people started coming, and it was just this weird thing of, like, do you know, I, I didn't have to work very hard at that. And it's actually the most successful Alpha course I've ever run. 100% of people on it became a Christian. Do you know, it was one person, but it's, it's still, like, the numbers stack up, right? But in that moment, I realized that it was so not about me. It was so about him and just having the space. And all I did was listen. I listened to what he had to say and said, you know what, I've got something to say about that from a Christian point of view. And I didn't ram it down his throat. I didn't say, ah, oh, it's sunny outside, and that's because God provides the sunshine for us, and your life will be miraculously transformed by following Jesus. That's not what I did. I heard where he was at, and I realized that I could say something from a Christian point of view into that. And I just want to leave you with this. Could I get the last slide up, please, Roy? We need to share our stories, or more to the point, you need to share your stories. We need to unfold our arms. We need to step out of our comfort zone. And we need to blow bubbles and listen. And then when we get the opportunity, just share. Share whatever it is, however small, however big. We just need to share. And I'm just going to leave you with that today. Is that okay? But what I would love to do, actually, is I was driving through, bopping away to Daft Punk. I actually, I was praying for you. And, and I feel that, like, God's just given me a couple of things that I'd love to share with you. So I'd just uh, like to invite the Holy Spirit to come. Like, don't worry, at home, God isn't scared of fiber optic. He can get you there as well. So just if, if, you, um, if you feel comfortable, just put your hands out as though you're going to receive. And I'm just going to ask the Holy Spirit to come. And I'm just going to share what it is I think he's put on my heart for you. Just say, come Holy Spirit. More of you, Lord. More of you. And the first thing is, I, I think there's a couple of people sitting at home who just feel a bit awkward with this whole thing. But actually, I would just, I would just encourage you, just this one time, just indulge me. Just, just try it. Just sit with your hands 
and just see if God wants to say something to you today. Now, I, I really feel that there are some people out there, whether in the room or at home, who just can almost feel the tingling on their lips of the Holy Spirit saying you need to speak more. You know, you know what it is you need to say to people. And actually, I would just love to pray for you guys right now just to be bold in that. Just, Lord, I just ask that you just anoint those people. You give them the words to speak in the time that is right. And actually give them your words, Lord. Make it so easy that they don't have to worry about it, that they don't have to get anxious about it, that there's just a naturally, supernatural release of your words, Lord. And I, the other thing that I just really felt as I was coming over was that there's some people who just need to, just need to let loose some hurt from the past. Like they've, they've tried to share their stories. They've tried to share who they are with people and it's been painful and you've had pushback and people have given you a hard time and that's scarred you and scarred your heart. So Lord, I'd like to pl pray for healing for that. I'd love to pray for hearts to be healed, scars to be lifted and actually for that, that pain just to wash away. And that actually we're given a renewed sense of urgency for the gospel, a renewed sense of the importance of the stories that you've put into our lives, Lord. Yeah, just more of you, Lord, just more of you.